Hello, 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 and welcome to another One Lion of Code. I am One Lion. I am also behind, as per usual, talking on Big Gaby stream, hanging out with him. Um, let's see. I need to go into this, click on announcements, and say how well I am live. Boosh. And I need to pause this timer, as I am no longer on the clock. Okay, hi, hello everyone. I hope you're doing well on this fantastic Friday. It's Friday! And you know what that means on this channel? It means that I have not yet connected the bots. That's not what it's supposed to mean. Hello, Mr. Bot. One boring lion. So, hi, one Von. I hope you're having a fantastic day so far. Um, because I am now um, fully, fully, what's the word I'm looking for? Fully working directly with RMA, with the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. I am able to set my own schedule, like completely set my own schedule, not one of those, you know, as long as you're available during blah, 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 but it really is my own schedule. Um, but because of that, I have a timer where I am actually tracking the hours that, or the, the up to the minute um, that I am at my desk um, working on the client project, working on the actual work products. And so I pause the timer when I'm getting coffee for the second time in the morning, um, taking the hour break for exercise. But... Yeah, I mean, it's just really easy for me to do. It's just a timer that runs and I hit pause when I step away and then resume it when I'm back doing work pause when I'm streaming kinda kinda it's actually in the um accounting app that we use ow because it doesn't tell me when to take a break or anything Oof. okay bye um <laughs> So, what I was trying to say is Friday, Friday, yeah. So it pretty much um, tracks my time and then puts it into the system directly. And, and yeah, I can create invoices and stuff from there. <laughs> yeah. So you get lost in what you're doing and then it, it wakes you up and like, you need to take a break. Yeah, I don't really, I have a, a pretty strong routine and my breaks happen when I run out of water and I need to go refill it or my bladder gets full or um, just the standard things that I do. So exercise at 730 every weekday and streaming every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And those are my breaks. But yes, today is community day. That's what I was trying to get to. <laughs> Finally. So I'm starting my virtual cam, hopping into Discord so that that's ready. We should now see up at the top corner, you can see my little um, Discord avatar thing, Gravatar. Thank you, Dukasoft. Dukasoft, pay attention to Big Gamey, since I can at the moment. <laughs> um, but yes, on on this stream, on this channel, on Fridays, we do community days, which are uh, streams where I invite the community to hop into a Discord voice channel. So you can get there through the Discord link in the uh, information that I put up there about the community day. And, and the one that Dukasoft pinned. Um, 
hop into any of the voice channels and then let me know via stream chat that you're in a voice channel because it will get buried behind a whole bunch of other windows and I just won't be seeing it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, we'll be here in an hour. So when you get back, just remind me that you want to show it off and we will look at it. Absolutely. Um, in the intervening time, until we get guest stars, feel free to start any conversations you want in chat. I'll do, um, I'll pay attention to chat more than usual, which is kind of hard to do when I'm almost always in chat anyway and just answering <laughs> questions and having conversation. But today is special because you can use your voice if you so feel like it. If you don't want to use your voice, you can still participate in Community Day just by typing in chat. So definitely feel free. We'll be here. Um, but as mentioned, until then, I'm going to move this Visual Studio instance out of the way because that's my RMA work. I was trying to add Fluent um, UI so that I can use their um, fast grid. But um, <laughs> this, I didn't remember, but this project is still targeting .NET 6. And I think the Fluent UI package that I was trying to use up front was uh, only .NET 8. And then I was looking through all of the versions that are on NuGet and they're all targeting, or they require .NET 8 minimum. But I'm sure there was another one. Um, that had like the preview fast components or an actual release of the fast components that was compatible with Donut 6. But we'll find out. I mean, I'll find out. <laughs> um, once we're done, by the way, this is the financial management tracking application, what we've been doing every other stream, every other stream during the other streams, which is um, an application that we did on stream beginning to end. You can definitely check it out if you're interested in it um, on GitHub. It's open source. You can contribute to it still. But um, the state that it's at, which is this dark colored um, design here. Hello, Deflux. So this dark colored design here is um, what what state the app currently is. And I am wanting to redesign it and make it something that is appealing to see, to use. And with that, I'm moving it over to moving the original designs over from the free Figma board to the Figma team. Yeah, the Figma team that um, has premium access so that I can use some more pages. And that's really the main reason I wanted it was to organize my components better in their own design file in a page kind of way, and then have the actual designs themselves in its own set of pages as well. And then be able to use libraries that are shared across the entire team. So, um, I'm currently also doing that for my work. So if I were to stream my work again, instead of doing what I was doing, uh, the financial management tracker, you'd still be seeing me working in Figma. So I figure it's not too different than trying to get the um, financial management tracker UI updated and cleaned up and everything. Ooh, okay. So that's that about that. Um, Archive notes. What else do I have open up this window that shouldn't be open? Um, okay, I am opening a new instance of Visual Studio because as we wait for our viewers and participants for Community Day to join, um, I will be trying to make a little bit of progress on the bot remake as well, which I doubt I'm going to get very far, but may as well try. Um, this bot remake, I am taking the bot that we currently have in stream, which by the way, I need to turn on or load the LLM model. Um, take the bot that we are using on stream and um, remake it cleanly using .NET 8 as well. Why isn't that loading? That's not a good sign. Hey, Thyrovius. I could have sworn I started the bot. And 
and took us off with a dad joke. Why do cows wear bells? Because their horns don't work. Their, their horns. Oh no, it looks like it restarted. Did you do an update without me telling you to? Yeah, my bot does work, but my LLM, on the other hand, does not. Because that computer restarted. Which means that the PowerShell that was running the LLM closed. I don't even remember giving you permission to auto restart at this time during the day. Probably crashed. Hello? Dude, where is my command to start the LLM? But yeah, um, so today, community day, I obviously have a couple of things that I wouldn't mind talking about. I'll, of course, let you guys drive the conversation. TVD Gamer with a resub. Oh, man, thank you so much. You're so very much appreciated. Um, I hope your stand-up went well. Kind of seems like it's it's late enough for your stand-up to have been over for you to be there and back again. Um, but TVD Gamer is a fantastic app developer. He also does some game dev. He's been doing a Godot game dev on Mondays and Tuesdays in place of Water Drink Water because he's been pulling back on his work on Water Drink Water, which is his community stream project um, that he asks his members, his community members to participate in. Um, he doesn't want to make it feel like it's just another project that he's working on by himself, but giving people an opportunity to contribute to it if they want. And you absolutely can. You absolutely can. I'll try to help you stay to your goal. Um, I'll still let you drive. Where did Discord go? Um, while I'm trying to find Discord, uh, TVD Gamer also works on a large... Uh, I'm going to call it large, but on a project that has to do with, um, I'm pulling you into the stream room now, Peter, on a project that has to do with project management project and he calls it Liquid Sky. I can hear myself. I just muted you. <laughs> the other That's you, okay. not, not the, not the modern you, but the two seconds ago, you. The modern Yeah. You. I need to turn you up in my ears though, but you, you sound good on the or your volume levels are good in the OBS. TBD yeah. Gamer says, uh, kick me out, check, and I approve. Harass. Give me the full harassment treatment. <laughs> cool. uh, if I exceed the time. Backseat the time? Is that what you said? No, if I ex exceed. If the you time. exceed, if I exceed the time. I'm, I'm good at reading or listening. And Deflux is also ready, pulling you in. Um, but the topics, if if you guys don't have anything super duper pressing that you absolutely want to talk about, I, I want to talk about it. impressions from build. Okay. Of course. Yeah, it's a great topic. I don't have, I, I probably have the least opinion because I paid the least attention. But you had some good, good comments in Discord. My real take is... Well, okay, I'll give the comment on Discord. Number one, feels like every company in the world, including I saw an anecdote that Google is doing this as well, they are repurposing their army of developers to work on AI stuff. Um, and my gut, my complete guess, is that they did so by basically canceling features and products. Everyone's doing that, and so... Mm. That's a guess. And the, I, my I, whole theory... I don't think they did. Okay, go ahead. I, I think I think what's happened is, and this is typical, is looking like you're... I'm going to mute the strings. I hear myself double hold up. There you go. Uh, um, I, I, think, I think the marketing team... I think marketing teams at these companies, especially technology companies, are really good. And uh, even, I remember watching the marketing for uh, Microsoft Edge back in like Windows 8 when it was like the different, not the edge like that it is today, which is the Chromium based, but the homegrown Microsoft one. And the marketing they did with that was absolutely amazing. 
you would think it's like this brand new browser thing, but it, it wasn't actually that great. Uh, um, and that is, I think everyone is forced marketing wise for the point that it's a publicly traded company to produce as if everyone's working on AI, that they have to say it out loud. But I think in the background, the business as a whole, nothing changes. Like, like I think, I think maybe even some people in the chat have been in that where like the company says, oh, we're doing all these interesting things. Then in reality, nothing changes. No one's, no one's getting, you know what I mean? No one's getting promoted or anything. I mean, I'm definitely one of the people that was like, uh, one thing that the client that I was with was wanting to do is add AI for like um, context sensitive troubleshooting on hardware devices to the app that I was working on. And that sounded like a ton of fun had I stayed with um, the team. And they really do sound like they want to push for it. But the the thing that I'm more interested in is what the role of the developer is going to look like with this massive push to let's AI everything. Yeah, who knows? It, yeah, my other take was that the AI stuff I've seen today, and this is late May of 2024, you could probably note that, uh, it doesn't look like it is, I don't want to say useful, but like, at best, it helps you out. It's like a multiplier, like I'm 10% more productive while coding. That's how it feels to me. Right. Yeah. And that is personal experience, etc. I'm not very advanced. I always want to talk about how other people experience their AI <laughs> assistance. Really? Well, yeah. I, I was going to say, we are at the consumer level with these new AI pushes, right? So the type of AI that you and I consume is the same consumer grade stuff that are, um, um, that the general public is using, right? So like the, the for instance, Maybe. Was that, that new chat GBT O just came out that mm -hmm. like can now search the internet, right? right? We didn't get that like three years ahead of the, the general public. We for, got that the yeah, same yeah. day as you know, some Sam. Yes. So what, what, what I guess is like, what, what, when people say, well, it's just about, it's only like a little bit useful. It's like, well, yes, if you engage it at a consumer level, because at the consumer level, it's the finished product. And if the finished product doesn't meet your use case, then you can't use it. That's that's like what I would consider a consumer product. So like, for instance, like the whole, remember when iPhone came out and he did like the demo and then like pulled down the menu and he did that little like sort of spring effect. I don't know quite what it's called, where it goes past like the... I know what the, it's called. It's called momentum scroll. Momentum scroll. There you go. Thank you. Nice. Right. And, <laughs> Only and, because and we had time. an issue in the other application with momentum scroll. <laughs> uh -huh. Like yeah, so like on the iPhone, you like pull the menu up and uh, um, it goes past the the top of the list in like yep. a sort of a refreshing thing. Mm -hmm. When that was when Steve Jobs did that on on the on the stage in two thousand seven, everybody there was like an ooh in the audience because it's a brand new thing. But the technology to do that had been around for ages. It's just that it was put together in a consumer product and sold to the consumer, and only then did it become sort of interesting. So, um, I, I would say that that, uh, uh, that there's a lot, a lot, lot, lot you could do with AI with the stuff that they're currently putting out. But you have to be like an engineer working in one of these companies, or you have to be somewhere high up the chain to uh, um, in, in terms of where this product is. Actually, seeing those benefits, and that's why uh, um, you see them make changes, and it goes directly to consumer grade products. They don't go through developers. They don't go through an engineering industry phase step. It goes directly to the public. I'm just, how do I say this? Like, I am being very careful with my statements because I have been so wrong. One of my early calls. You're allowed to be wrong school, on this call. <laughs> I, I said the internet wouldn't last. It was 1996. <laughs> nice. Dial-up was the was the primary access and i was like something's got to change you know what changed nothing <laughs> and it's doing great yeah you know, there are problems but it's like a global network yeah there are going to be problems it's not yeah, do, do not feel bad Absolutely. do not feel bad i was i was so, laughing my when i went to school in my science book it said in now i went to a school in the science books were underfunded school science books were really old so I had like okay. a science book from like the early 90s and the late 2000s or something. You know, it was like over a year, 10, 10, at least 10 decades, not 10 decades, 10 years, a decade worth of use of the book I was given. And it said in there that we would run out of oil by 2015 and there might be flat screen wow. TVs in the next 10 years. I remember thinking, I have a flat screen TV. It's at home. It's not in the future like the science book suggests. <laughs> and we didn't run out of oil. 
And so, <laughs> yeah. That was... Another thing that um, came to mind, and I just kind of want to throw this out there because when they brought Sam Altman during, I think it was the end of the keynote um, on stage, they were like pushing this whole, so you have an audience of developers out here. What would you say to them about AI? And he's talking all of this stuff, but he, he kept using this term platform shift as opposed to something like a paradigm shift in how we do development. Because I think he's imagining that software development is actually going to be, there's going to be an AI platform that we do software development with. And so that to me does sound like a logical next evolutionary step for software development. And let's just start there. I have more to say on that. But do you guys have any comments on, on that thought? Sounds like the network devices that were dying out in the late 90s when I went to college. Um, they like dumb terminals, right? Where does that is that what you interpreted it to be? Like, hey, everyone's going to connect to the huge AI cluster with their dumb terminal. We're going to develop because they're going to use eight GPUs full full bore all the time, or you know they're going to use eight GPUs out of 50,000 right you know so so you're saying dumb terminals this is the death of the local pc maybe not just local well, pc but actually writing code by hand like putting syntax on the screen well i was gonna say the 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 uh was it we went through this uh um well what one line will know about this because the the hololens doesn't have a CPU and a graphics card. It has a CPU and a graphics card and I think it's an APU or something they call it. Uh, for like the spatial... HPU. HPU, there you go. And this is just a rebranding of the HPU, essentially. It's, it's a an NPU, stuff. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just a rebranding. So they just changed the letter. <laughs> uh, um, well, it's Completely a... different um, uh, responsibilities, but yeah. I mean, it's well, just no, adding it, another it was... type of processor. Right, it was a processor to, to meet the specific use case for the device mm -hmm. itself, as opposed mm -hmm. to a general processor for any program you load into it. Right. So I, if I'm picking up what you're putting down, which is I didn't actually have time to watch the whole thing, so I watched all the bits of it. No, I didn't either. Uh, um, I lost interest. Is that, that they were saying that there's going to be a specific unit, a specific processor unit yeah. for the AI stuff, right? Yes. Which is exactly what they did in, in the in whole HoloLens. Room. Yeah. That's why I say it's a rebranding because like, yeah, not necessarily probably the rebranding, but definitely following the same pattern um, and creating a specialized processor for doing what right now we're relying on graphics cards to do. Right. And sometimes CPUs if you want to let it go slow. But, but, but I am down for the whole uh, um, uh, boilerplate code business. But not even the whole, so, that, that was, yeah, yeah, beyond that beyond that they are talking like what they want to push and i'm in favor of this by the way i'm not talking negatively about it but what they want to push is instead of writing code with syntax that we're familiar with c sharp projects solutions whatever we will be using ai to generate applications and the people that are going to be the ones doing the majority of the work to create the application are still going to be developers but they aren't going to be the developers that write code it's been how does a that dream make you since... feel <laughs> it it's an old dream it is like it's... like do you remember rational rose i know the have to name. look that up i know the name or any 4gl language or a graphical so workflow familiar. engine so those are the three things I've been hearing my whole career, especially in Microsoft ecosystem, especially the office group for Microsoft seems to try a new workflow engine every two months, it feels like. But uh, basically they, they say, you don't, you don't need to worry yourself with the details. We're going to take care of the details. We'll just, you know, give you this 4GL uh -huh. language, yep, yep, very high yep. level. Yep. Or we're giving you a 
workflow engine and all you have to do is you know draw arrows and it'll be easy and the reality is it's not easy it's easier to code in c sharp especially when debugging time comes around <laughs> man um anyway i i just i don't see this as new especially from microsoft they're both pushing not, fabric Fabric and Azure, I guess they're mm -hmm. pushing, but they they've had like Azure Data Factory. They've had uh, I I have actually implemented Windows Communication, not Communication Foundation, Windows Workflow Foundation. WCF. <laughs> WWF. Yeah. WWF. Uh, Isn't that a which, boxing uh, thing? I'm sorry, what? No, is that a boxing Wrestling. fight thing? WWF. Yeah, the w well, everyone's getting sued, whatever it is. <laughs> but I've I have actually done Windows Workflow Foundation, <laughs> and it was so hard to get working. Mm -hmm. And it is so much easier, believe it or not. You know, there's two kinds of complexity. There's like learning a new concept in C sharp and implementing something complex. Let's call it leak code. Then there's like I have to figure out how the Workflow Foundation works. And their docs aren't yeah, very so good, the and the examples are garbage. Yeah, you have to learn the tool, and then the tool changes, and all your learning disappears. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right. that's my rant. That was the first no. Rant. I love that. That's exactly one of the one of the things that I was thinking about when this happened, because it is going to happen when this happens. So, mm -hmm. yes, I do love that. I, I okay. went ahead and uh, oh, go ahead. googled yeah. rational rows. Mm -hmm. And I opened up the first two, I'll link them in chat real quick, but I've opened up the first two websites I saw. You mean this thing that's on the screen? Uh, yeah, yeah. And I thought <laughs> it was funny that uh, neither of them have I images, pictures of what the app is. Which is, I thought was right. hilarious, because isn't it supposed to be like an image drag and drop thing, but they don't actually have any images of what the software is? Yep. <laughs> well, I never... Yeah. It was meant to be for architects. There was like this whole like ceremony of like the priesthood, the architects worked in rational rows, dumped out the code generation to the coders who would implement it. And of course right. that was like guaranteed to not work, but we were all dummies in the nineties and it yeah, was well, dying off even back then. <laughs> well, I, I have colleagues of mine that are experts at this, what, Informatica? I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm -hmm. No. You haven't heard it's same, same, the same gig. It's probably an offshoot, but same thing. It's a drag and drop process thing. I, I linked mm -hmm. it in there. There it is. Yep. Everybody's ready for AI except your data. <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> My data is absolutely ready. My databases are. Where's the screenshots? <laughs> uh, we don't want. We don't want screenshots. That'd be too boring. Lies. Low code, yeah, so, no code. Yeah, yeah low code, no it. code. And that's really going to be a, a shift. And so I think, well, no, deflexing work done. Go ahead. I was going to say that that's how I came into doing C sharp. I would used I used to do before this. I did Power Apps in yeah. in Azure's Azure's uh, Power Apps um, thing. And then I started using, I started, it's hilarious now, but I started using SharePoint lists as like databases with like relationships and stuff. Oh, it was man. hilarious. Did it work? How many yeah, how much data yeah, did work. you have? Uh, I, I, I had a fair amount of data. We, we, uh, the, the company where I worked at refused to spend any money on any sort of like customer tracking stuffs or anything like we would do everything by pen and paper. So I did a very wow. simple app that sort of tracked. Who the customers were, kept a record of their name, and then the, the computer that we repaired. Wow. Mm. Okay. Well, I'm just curious because I had problems in the past with performance, and I did nothing complex. We, this stream is about software development. We don't need to know about these personal issues. Yeah, there are <laughs> deep, some deep-seated <laughs> anger. If we're if we're being real, yeah, I've got some uh, deep-seated anger at certain platforms products and oh the, anyway <laughs> tvd um i apologize I, I really do want to take what you're saying seriously 
<laughs> yeah, no, don't worry about it. Look, <laughs> I will rage. Y'all all laugh. I'll rage at SharePoint, and then mm. we will we will oh, get I back to I did love how SharePoint came up during work. build. That was funny. It and is. it actually is pretty smart. So yeah, they they're of course wanting to put Copilot everywhere, and it, you can imagine um, organizations, enterprises that have large SharePoints already with a whole bunch of documents and lists and whatever else they have in there, and putting um, AI on top of that and being able to use it as the um, as the rag essentially uh, index stuff, and then being oh, able to just ask it where's this document or what's in this document. I like how TBD is saying he avoided SharePoint. This is this is not uh, it's not true. TBD TBD avoided the cloud in its entirety, <laughs> which so happened to be SharePoint Online is a product that Microsoft puts out. Uh, right. <laughs> Same like he's like, it's like, well, I avoided that one bad product. <laughs> so this is great though. Um, I have here with me, by the way, for those of you that don't know these two, Peter, who goes by um, live coding in chat, and Dflux, who goes by Dflux streams in chat and hasn't really streamed. Um, but uh, Peter is very, I'm going to call you infrastructure-y. Um, yeah, I'm, I do ops work full time. Yeah. And Dflux is developer-y. <laughs> so I would like to know from both of your individual perspectives how you feel um, so I hear a lot of people talking about AI taking over developer work, but instead of that topic, how about how do you feel um, the AI transformation is affecting your ability to do your job? So using a, the push to use AI tools to automate a whole bunch of stuff that you are doing manually. What are your feelings about that? It doesn't work yet for me. Okay. That's real talk. Wanna elaborate? Um I'm about to sneeze, so at oh. any moment if you hear a giant explosion. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um just Oh boy. <laughs> All right, I hopefully I muted. All right, you another did. one's coming. <laughs> but I thought right, this uh, is allergies <laughs> allergies to AI is, is catching up with them. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, that was two. Um We'll okay, uh, so it, this is my rant earlier in the chat room, the Discord about encapsulation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk through the idea of very vaguely encapsulation. I'm not talking about code encapsulation. I'm talking about I show up in a meeting and they say, we need to deploy this website um, and we need to do, have it working. And they, you know, that's it, right? Like, are there, what do you do there? How does AI change any of that? Good question. I thought you were going to give it us does, a, a, well, an answer on why it does not. <laughs> it does not change the answer because, honestly, this is where I keep coming back to encapsulation. If it was, if we had all the information up front, if our AIs were able to query us for all the additional information it needs, like it'll say, what's the URL of the website? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want it behind a CDN? Mm -hmm. do you, what, what region do you want it in? Uh, for us, for Azure, you can put it in different regions. Right. Anyway. Right. Um, the, and then, you know, hey, uh, you have a database. You I mean, uh, you definitely have a database. You haven't mentioned it. Let's talk database. Because you're not going to just spin up a static website. No one does that. People do that. So anyway, these are all questions. There's even more questions. You know, how are you going to deploy? I want to shove deployments back to the team that owns the website. So I need to train someone to do that. But let me just tell you, y'all, if you actually get a good system down for this, it's called platform engineering. Mm-hmm. And big companies do it, and we, a tiny company, do not do it. But you get a platform that will support most use cases for the team. So they can even maybe visit a website and say, I need a website with this database. And it makes them fill out an HTML form, and they fill it out, press enter, and they have a website. Like, what does AI change about that? Nothing, except... Nothing. 
I, I, I do have a response. I mean, I was saying nothing to agree with you because I wanted to agree with you. Um, <laughs> so before we go to UD Flux on the programming side of things, um, let's talk about this for a quick second. The dream or the goal, at least from what I was gathering based off of the conversations during build, is a conversational AI that you are sitting down and either talking with or interacting with in some way that is taking you through the process of asking you those questions for getting this thing set up and you're just having a conversation and that is what software development is going to look like you're talking with ai and it's doing everything for you i never believe anything will change but just remember this is the guy that said the internet can't sustain itself <laughs> and uh turns out i was wrong turns out so, so yeah, so anyway. in short, the thing that changes is the interface that you have for setting up that infrastructure, setting up the system, setting up mm -hmm. the website. And yeah, um, and hopefully less mistakes because AI is flawless and infallible. Uh, see, that was <laughs> the other thing. I brought that up. The uh, if you have an AI that actually has the knowledge of the world in it, it will be able to tell you about common pitfalls. It will be able to ask you all these other questions. Do you really need a website? Do you just need, you know, maybe we start deploying differently for API, like exclusively API websites. Maybe we have different like firewall rules and stuff. Right. Um, yeah, so the, the, like a good AI system can ask you questions in advance while you ask for a website, right, but a bad exactly. one. But these are good. I mean, but still think about it as either an AI or an old HTML form. You could just make a massive yep. HTML form because you know when you go to make a website we, in we Azure, just, it gives you this massive HTML form to fill out. What's up? We should just do a, a massive HTML form for every possible thing you could ever do online in your life. Just make it one <laughs> massive huge just dot com. You just go straight dot the website. You just go straight to dot com, and it takes you to the massive HTML form. You can select whatever you want. But no, uh, I, I just got a raid. You want to you want to address the raid? Welcome in. I am. I'm addressing. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, right, well, so I'll share from my perspective, and perhaps I have a unique perspective. But I don't write code anymore, as a rule. All the code that I wrote is written by AI. That is that I primarily, as a rule now, primarily interface with Copilot, co GitHub's Copilot, and then I'll have a conversation with that Copilot as to what the code should look like. Mm. And then if I disagree, sometimes I disagree with the Copilot, and so maybe what I'll do is I'll clean the session and then rehab that exact same conversation in a different way, emphasizing different important things. But generally speaking, I try not to be the author of the code. I try to do it with AI as a rule. Um, and so I think that has greatly increased the quality of the code that I put out. I think as a whole, it slowed me down a little bit in terms of that that conversation takes time, especially with how long it takes for things to type out. And the more complex code you get into, the more uh, um, the longer the response is, right? So mm -hmm. this takes longer. But if you have the ability to break down your code into steps and methods that you can refactor, well, then you're onto a winning, winning strategy. Uh, and so that's what I've been doing over the past say year or so now is I've been going through the code base where I work and breaking things down into reasonable, manageable steps uh, rather than having sort of longer methods. And that way I could use the tooling more efficiently and that way I can do more as a software developer. Cool. Uh, so so as, as like I say, as a general rule, I do not write code as a software developer. Cool. I would, um, well, I, I do like that. I do like that that's your um, feeling of how it's currently impacting you. So we'll get to the next part in a second, but to comment on that, when you are starting off or when you are not feeling as confident about your coding and you do have access to something like Copilot, I think that that is like just awesome to be able to have as a developer in this day and age. Um, I, I was able to write code before any of this, and you were too, um, before any IntelliSense and any... Um, co-pilots or anything like that so i know the struggles of needing to have this information in your head all the time because you want it to be elite coder not really um but or needing to look something up every time so you're saying that this conversation with co-pilot take maybe slows you down because it takes longer 
But think of all the things you'd have to look up and how long that takes. And also think of how much, um, how many errors you could potentially write into your code, not on purpose, of course, um, but that you aren't going to write in there if you are using AI assistance, provided <laughs> the AI assistance is quality and you are double checking it for validity in your code, in your context. Yeah, I think it's probably also worth pointing out the type of code that I'm doing this with. So this is, you know, we, we have years of code before AI, right? And so that this that's the, the type of code that I typically work in. I'm refactoring other other people's code. And so having the AI tool is really good because you can clearly improve upon it with quite little, you know, effort. Yeah, a little effort. It doesn't take a lot of effort for you to get in there and actually make sense of the code, line it out properly, split it up properly, and make it easy to manage. Agreed. Yeah. So I do like that. So um, just to read off Andreas's uh, question, first of all, if you guys haven't seen Andreas, he's a fantastic streamer. He's an app dev. He works in um, right now. He's working on remaking his bot using Blazor with a whole bunch of technologies in the back. Signal R um, um, and other things. <laughs> Twitch lib, etc. And his streams are just so fun. They're so cool. He's and he's a really cool person. So definitely check him out if you haven't. Um, but so the thing that I wanted to cover with you, Deflux, on the software development side is imagine a time where the only thing you're doing is either typing in chat and code is being generated for you. The entire project is being generated for you, or you're having a, a verbal conversation with AI. What yeah, does, I mean, because what does that think make you about, feel? Think about what's actually happening in the background is when you're having that conversation, is you're basically picking the template, uh, um, from like like the list of templates that like that'll be the start of the app, right? You're picking a template. Um, no, the start of the app is you pick an AI agent to speak with, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. I mean, right now, like right now, if you were to open up a new Blazor app, you'd start oh, with yeah, a template, yeah, yeah. right? Yes, you start with a template so that, currently. That's where you start. The, the, so I imagine the very first thing in the conversation tries to work out is which template are you referring to? Do you want a Blazor app? Do you want a console app? Right, and so on and so on, right? Um, and then from there, it's it's like the the basic features of the application, like whether or not the, um, the render modes are global or whether they're per component. All the kind of stuff is that that's definitely something you could have in a conversation, right? So there's out, outside of that, that the, it first, and again, think about, uh, um, well, not again, but think about what's that one, uh, um, uh, don't ever aspire, right? So you can right. say, add an Azure function, add a database, and it knows how to do that in code. It's not difficult for it to do. Um, so I, I, there's very little I don't think I couldn't do through, through a tool like that. Now, sometimes, like I say, I'll have conversations and then I'll, uh, um, um, then I'll, uh, uh, uh review the history, code, right? I've, see if yeah, you... I've gone the wrong direction. Well, right. yeah, I'll have the conversation. I realize I've gone sort of the wrong direction where I find myself in like a loop where I'm asking the question and it can't provide the answer. That's really because I'm asking the tool the wrong things or I spoke about it in the wrong way or I haven't emphasized, you know, I've realized that other things are important from when I started, stuff like this. Uh, um, so I'll go back and rehab those conversations. But other than that, I, I I don't come across a scenario often where it can't write what I need it to write. So let me turn the question then to chat. For those of you that have been developing for a long time, I'm looking at you, TBD, kidding. Um, <laughs> how do you feel, and I will give my impressions on this, how do you feel about no longer writing code to create an application that, that's no longer a developer expectation in the future. It's not going to happen anytime soon, in my opinion, because we have a lot of legacy applications and even our modern applications where code needs to be maintained in order to update a website until things are shifted to where AI can start making those changes to existing applications, to existing code bases and do the deploy and fix builds and or not build. You know what I mean by builds pipelines and um, correct infrastructure issues. But eventually, I, I do foresee us being at a point where we aren't really writing code very often, if at all. 
So President Asher said, I'm not feeling too great about it. Um, Napalm says, just just last me until retirement, then I don't care anymore. Brutal. Let me give y'all <laughs> encouragement. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to also pop a bubble in my own encouragement. But so speech recognition technology has been, quote, close for like how long? Like it's been really close. <laughs> close. Since the seventies, since, since Vista's, since Vista, right? <laughs> no, like since seventies. No, like, well, do you remember? Do you remember the Vista presentation? NLP. Do you guys remember that? No. You, you guys really. are that, that Vista did that when they first released Vista. They did a whole like we've in, we've in, incorporated speech into Vista, and they did a live demo, and the demo was like bombed. It was terrible, oh, and that killed God. Vista. <laughs> I do not remember that, but for the best um i mean dragon naturally speaking was doing a uh, medical transcription uh for over maybe two decades i don't know mm -hmm. a long long time now the thing that i was gonna bust the bubble is that but my point is like you would expect a steady rate of improvement and there was none <laughs> Or whatever improvement there was, was marginal for a long time. And then, uh, you know, deep learning comes around. I happen to know about speech recognition software because I maintain one of them as my ops. And it really is being eaten up by this new large language model. So maybe I'm, whatever, countermanding my own argument. But what I'm saying is... It is possible these AI assistants will sit at almost useful for decades. It's yeah. possible. Yeah. Like, we don't know that. how this is going to turn out. You can hope. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're wrong. Definitely can see that as um, something that will be sitting on the cusp of for a really long time. But at the same time, they have kind of shown that the, the rate of progress has been pretty high. So, oh, yeah, for this AI stuff, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, a yeah. <laughs> um, couple more um, comments from chat real quick. I do. Uh, President Nasher says, I do wonder whether I'll have to retire earlier than I might have because my approach is too outdated. TBD Gamer said, same here. I don't know if I want to spend the energy getting up to speed with a lot of these technologies. And then I remember playing with voice. Um, Voice rec. I don't know what voice rec is. But recognition. Probably. Voice recognition. Thank you. Um, in the late '90s, it's been around longer than the World Wide Web. And then to you, Peter, probably thought it was a fad. <laughs> that was a slam. Well done. <laughs> and the napalm said, "I. I mean, I'm approaching 40. Not 40." <laughs> I am hoping to retire at 55, but the world economy and healthcare is not making me feel good about it. So just real quick to share to share my thoughts on this, because I love writing code. I would absolutely miss putting syntax and having it look pretty in my eyes um, and then being able to just throw together some classes, methods and make make an application do something on screen. I would miss that very much. But at the same time, if I'm able to create the thing that I am envisioning easier and with less error and with less difficulty, I'm all for that. So I'm torn about it. I kind of want I, I it would to think happen of it, already. I, I would th like, you know how some people do autobiographies of other people? Uh huh. I, I would, I, it's, it's, to me, it's like, well, if I'm envisioning or I think about the future, I would think of it more along the lines of like, the, the uh, uh you're writing an autobiography on that's probably a bad example i'm more thinking of like writing so like the ai is actually doing the writing and you're you are uh, um you are uh ensuring that it has the intended result right so it's not that you wouldn't be writing code you would still be writing code but uh um um like the layout the format the spacing the like the code the comment blocks everything like that is already done for you right I'm nodding i'm sorry you can't see me nod, yes yes probably. no i'm reading I'm also <laughs> a week at the same time oh you know what i didn't even start uh, that's why i didn't start my camera in the stream room my bad 
Well, it's no autobiography. Worries, I don't watch. Freaking Google. It. But I put I put the link for the Vista talk that they did, the infamous Vista voice stuff in in general. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's it's hilarious. Definitely will check um, out later. I, I, and people people laughed at the time, which was I think was the best because it was going absolutely so horribly wrong, and the whole audience just started dying halfway through the Microsoft presentation. <laughs> Brilliant. But yeah, I, I would think of it more in that terms of relationship. Like, like it's not that you're not going to be writing code. Uh, and one of the things you also got to think about is actually, so, like C Sharp and languages like that, uh, most la all languages pretty much, are designed for humans to write. That's the other part of the puzzle. That's why AI is not that good at it, because it wasn't designed for AI. I think if they come out with a different language that's designed just for AI, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? That might be a different story. Yeah. But, but, uh, um, which is entirely uh, possible that AI will be the one to come up with the programming language AI uses to write applications for human consumption. Right. Yeah. You'll just have but, to write, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm like, you're going to have to write it every three lines and then don't do that when I'm drinking. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's <laughs> uh, so true. <laughs> but, but then, but then the obviously limitation is, is sort of the, um, the, what do you call it, linear or might say the way it consumes information from humans is very linear it's line by line right which is very much inefficient there's a lot more you know when i'm talking to you or you're talking to me or we're, we're together in a room i'm picking up on so many more things than just what's actually coming out your mouth in terms of what you're saying picking up on your body language i'm picking up on the what you're right. talking about how you feel about it all these sorts of things it's very difficult to communicate into a linear um not position. necessarily so, do you well, think I, well, that that's interesting? Do you think maybe we could get like an AI tool that reads people's body language? Well, the not, it doesn't even need to read body <laughs> language. Like there are nuances in speech that can be picked up that as humans, like maybe subconsciously we do and we pair it with body language because we're so reliant on vision or on um, the movement of air around us or energetic feelings, whatever. But there probably is something that can be detected in speech alone if it's studied enough to be able to convey the meaning that you and I would normally get uh, physically. I, it'd be funny if like, you know, it's like Steve from sales has come down. He's the number one software developer because he knows how to talk to AI. Like that was salesy sort of like, yeah, positive, exactly. like he talks positively to AI and the AI works faster <laughs> or something. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, Big Gamey just came in. Just giving a quick shout out for Big Gamey. He's a game streamer. Check him out. Very fun times over on a stream. All right, go ahead, Deflex. Didn't mean to. Well, I'll come in, but no, that that, that would be funny if uh, if it this, the AI was actually like listening to not just what you're saying, but actually like how you're saying it, and then like code like you know put code comments like, but it's okay then. You know, this might work. You know, <laughs> just sort of encourage you along or something. That'd be hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Oh. I, I have my rant. Rant okay. number two, yes. which is just repeating rant number one, but carefully. <laughs> okay. So I have been very wrong in the past. Uh oh, oh no. Well, now's a great time to do your rant. Um, let me just say hi to everyone real quick, like twenty seconds, because I know that you have a hard stop. Um, we're currently in the middle of a community day. We're talking about Microsoft Build, but not really just Microsoft Build. Now AI and software development. So Peter's about to give a fantastic rant, re-rant in a more careful way. So please do. Okay. Here goes. Um, welcome everybody. So in the in the elder days, we believed that things like rational rows would let you encapsulate away software development. Um uh, and they okay. we even in the modern day, we sorry, before that we had workflow engines. We've had workflow engines that where you draw lines to boxes. And it was supposed to eliminate 90% of your coding. And co consulting companies I've worked for sold projects that way. <laughs> and it didn't work out so great. Oh. Uh, didn't get sued though, so it was minimally effective. That was good. That was success. Um, so now we have AI. Now I might be wrong, but currently AI is not useful enough. And I have not seen 4.0. GPT 4.0. Um, AI is not useful enough to replace 
software development. I, you know, we've seen the demos people have made, uh, Flappy Birds by just asking a question. Right. But or the problem, the thing about software development is you can't just say, I want Flappy Birds. You know, I want Minecraft mixed with Terraria, which I, I guess would be Terraria, for the record. Um, like, you can't just say that to an AI. Like, there are all the details. And it is my can, my assertion that you cannot get rid of all of these details. You are going to have to deal with the details. And that is the act of programming. Now, in uh, how do I say this? Oh, so I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm petering out. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to finish my stand up on a rant. Wait, wait, and wait, I wait. Made you before all you do, low. let me just oh, give no. one one real quick retort. Because I've wanted, I was trying to. This is just me trying to insert this because I was trying to find a way to bring this up. So your statement is: we would most likely. I'm going to use the my terms. Most likely, never be able to fully abstract away from writing code in some form, and. What I would say is, do we still punch cards to, you know, put holes in cards and feed them through a machine to write code? To I will say, I fully agree with you. The old punch card mainframe days, people were so inefficient. You know that they would read in files in COBOL, like do like basic addition because nothing else was possible, basically, and then write it back. To a massive file and that was COBOL programming. We are so much more efficient nowadays. Now what's sad is that we had this burst of efficiency during the Ruby on Rails days and uh, we've kind of regressed a little since then. Like it was really easy to deploy a Ruby website. I don't know if y'all have even seen it. No. But uh, only ahead. seen Ruby used. Yeah, I've never, I don't know. I, I, is that Lavro, I think, or something? Well, that's PHP, right? That's PHP. And, and a lot of Lam people copy. Honestly, Ruby on Rails has been copied to where .NET project basically looks like one. It just doesn't have the Rails console. It doesn't have a few other things. And it runs probably 10 times faster. E um, but for deploying, it was literally a Git push. And you would log into the, whatever, the... Uh, Heroku console and you would set some environment variables and you would have a database backed website. It was incredible. It was also free for years. Um, so I do think we've gotten for the most part mo more effective while the number of programmers has grown like always. I, I'm not an expert at number of programmers in the world but I, we can There's pretty much stay there's a lot. <laughs> there's, there's more. There's more now. Yes. Um, so I think we will get more efficient <laughs> and there will be more work to do. And then eventually we're all just going to be uh, influencing each other on Twitch. And oh, that will course. be our jobs. That'll be, <laughs> and that'll that'll be, be our full-time <laughs> job. So, so one one line is ahead of the game. I'm technically, <laughs> I have stream in my name. So I'm at least 1% of the way there. To be influencing each other on Twitch. Yeah. Brands. <laughs> It'll be the brands. interaction of brands. Yeah. All right. Well, well go ahead and do thing. some. Yeah. Oh, do you have a comment on this? Well, as I say, I think it's a good thing. I think I think uh, um, uh, the whole thing That's where it's like the drag and drop stuff uh -huh. with we talked about earlier with encapsulation. I think that is actually a very successful big business that a lot of businesses use. Uh, um, something like QuickBooks. QuickBooks is is an amazingly popular thing, and that's basically the same kind of thing, but in finance, right? They have like a whole little flow and the check goes to here, then it goes to there, then whatever, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and they do everything from like, you know, tracking not just business invoices, but like you know, assets and people and whatever. So I, I think that that uh, that line of products is a very popular line of products. Uh, obviously, it reshaped how we think about software development and obviously AI is doing the same thing. I don't think anyone's talking about replacing. I think I think you guys are always going to be right. I'm code. talking about replacing today, just for right. the fun of it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I was going to say I don't think that's realistic. I think like like I think I, if, I still uh, think it is realistic, not completely probabilistic, but 
it's still possible. Well, well, I guess like the Flappy Birds, it goes an example I guess was given earlier. Like setting up, like I, I, it would make sense to me if I could go to Unity, go to like uh, AI and pair it up with Unity and go, hey, I want my Unity game to do something like this. And then it does the something like this, and then I go perfect it. That that makes sense to me. That's realistic. That's something that it probably could do. That's probably something a product that people would want. I I would want to buy that right now. I don't know enough about Unity. Like I've played with it a little bit, but I don't. So, but I know C Sharp, right? So I could go in there and like describe a little bit about what I want, and then have it build out a bunch of stuff, and then I go in like add the assets and whatever, whatever the colors. Um, I, it certainly makes me more efficient. I'm certainly more efficient. I benefit from using those AI tools that I do use. Um, so I think if it, if it, like my problem is it doesn't do enough. So when I discuss something with it, it hasn't got enough, uh, context. It's not, uh, uh taking right, in right. enough of the yes. information, right? Right. Exactly. And so that's why I'm encouraging, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to these better toolings that could take in much more of that context, much more of that code base and provide a lot more educated answers. And I think it's going to get better and more efficient and, uh, um, the, the, we talked about this a while back i remember it's like the the phrase is your job is not going to be taken by ai but your job will be taken by someone using ai i think that's true that's true yeah. right I yeah i was gonna say <laughs> we'll continue this conversation Look, but peter is gonna yep. we <laughs> all agree game. that we're gonna be 20 percent more effective next week so i am <laughs> extending the team commit team scrum commitment I, an additional 20%. I will see y'all next week. I have no oh, Sorry, we didn't allow that. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brilliant response, by the way, right? Because we always try to say we're going to be more efficient next week. That's very true. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> we have increased capacity now. <laughs> okay. Um, so definitely along the lines of what you were talking about, I really do um, believe that the thing that's driving AI growth currently is the money that would come with it. Let's save money by having these systems create these things faster with fewer defects, um, with less resources, even though we're spending so much resources. Oh, that's another topic, but well, um, with fewer resources, which means we're, we're not going to spend as much money creating the product. We're going to make more money on the product. Our margins are going to get bigger and so we need this to be ready now says the big companies that want to profit off of well this. the keyword there is big I, I i i disagree uh i think the prima facie thing that's driving ai is the fact that these companies are publicly traded i think there's a lot more to do with why things are happening the way they're happening but i think behind the scenes nothing's changing uh Rome, um, in terms of the 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 what people's jobs are how they do those jobs they're building a couple of novel products, but most of this is the marketing team going crazy because this is increasing the stock value, increasing the value of the company, which right. is how they're compensated. Okay. Um, and and so if if this if if this wasn't happening, um, if just imagine the AI revolution happened not in America in terms of the product creation, open AI, and that stuff. Just imagine it happened in Russia or China or Portugal or somewhere else, right? None of this stuff would be happening, not because I don't know it would those... be happening. Culture is those... enough to know. Well, it's not a cultural thing. It's more that the, 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 this, this is a product of American... Just... <laughs> right, this, well, this is a product of the, the American reliance on publicly traded companies. Oh. Uh, um, and this, I think this is, plays off significantly more into that. It's because these are publicly owned companies that we, we basically all fund ourselves and you fund through your 401k or, or, or through stocks that you own um, um, you know, <laughs> by proxy. Uh, that we hear a lot more about this and what Microsoft's doing and how they're doing it and what Apple does and what all these Tesla does and all this kind of stuff. And it's a big, big conversational piece um, in society or in social media, this sort of thing, because it's basically undergirding, it's funding everything. It's, it's the typical crony capitalism. And so that's why we're hearing a lot more about it. But I think actually behind the scenes, the actual engineers, they're building a novel product. I think it's going to be a very successful product. But uh, um, you're going to see like five years from now, uh, a lot of this stuff sort of wind down and get rebranded into something else. Potentially. Yeah, so um, that does bring up the point that I am obviously seeing things through a limited perspective because I only have the experiences that I've had and I don't really look for um, other economic situations or anything like that because you know me. But the thing that I saw happening with the company that I was at, 
I'm not going to name them this time, but you guys know who I used to work for, um, was that everything was shifting over to sales. And one of the things that turned me off of MS Build, and that was one of the reasons I left the company. One of the reasons that I was turned off from MS Build was because a lot of it was sales oriented. And so I understand that <laughs> there are a lot of really good explanations that I've heard. Again, opinions such as they invested so much capital in all of these technologies, now they need to profit off of it. So they are, in my opinion, overcompensating on that. Um, and I am comparing it to previous build events, at least the ones that I attended, where there was a lot more product information still, but it was product information that was relevant to the current developer communities, as opposed to drop everything else. We don't care about evolving the C-sharp language. There's only one session about that. We don't care about... Um, you know, all of the new web technologies or frameworks or platforms. The only thing we care about are the cloud services dealing with AI because you need to use those, pay us to use them, and yep. we need to. Yeah, make money well, I mean, this that. is build, right? I mean, I mean yeah. that, that's what they. That, I mean, I guess. And this, like, is, like, this is what I get every time that I bring this up. So go ahead. Well, you know, I'll bring it up for you, but I guess that is the. Microsoft, there are different events throughout the year that these large companies do. Microsoft build event is to put out what Microsoft's internal devs are working on for Microsoft's products. So it, it, it is a big sales, it's, it's, it's the sales fest in terms of what right. Microsoft is doing, as opposed to those other Microsoft events that talk more about frameworks and like the different C-sharp stuff and this kind of stuff. Microsoft does not make money selling C-sharp to anyone. Right. Uh, um, it, it's a, but it, yeah, they get it by proxy. Um, so that, that they're not going to push that stuff heavy during a build event that might be in different events right um, yeah and that's that's why i was like i'm comparing it to previous build events where it didn't feel to me like it was a sales event it was here are products that you can use that we have developed that are out there they are developer focused products so we encourage you to use them um for example uh Nope, can't come up with one. Maybe when Functions first came out <laughs> or the, the updates to Azure Functions or Azure Apps or App Containers or Kubernetes or whatever. Um, those felt like here are these services that are available, but now it's like, okay, the only thing that we have available <laughs> that is going to be of interest to you from now on are our AI cloud services that cost an arm yep. leg for you to use. That that's I think that's uh, I think that's uh, a lot of what Azure uh, what they used to do with Azure was like brag about how cost effective it was and how you can be saving money right they did always talk about the different services and how you could buy it and it's only pay as you go where right. this like is a lot more like a cell phone plan in terms of it's like a yeah a same there's cost every so month, much hidden stuff it. <laughs> right yeah, yeah yeah exactly and they're like we don't want to tell you about the pricing plans that we have for them because they were really transparent about those before too in my opinion. Um, but now it's just like, you know, just go out there and create these co-pilot um, extensions and whatever else and run them on on our platform and you'll be fine. It's fine. Everything's fine. Well, I will have to say that uh, um, unfortunately I have to dip out as my, my wife has been patiently oh. waiting and you know, working <laughs> a couple of things around the house. Uh, right. So I, did, I still obviously want to come every week and do our little mini podcast here, but, uh, right. but I, I will have to dip out. Cool. We'll do your stand up first. Uh, yes, ask me the question. I've actually been doing stand up now. I've, this is like, I've done stand up okay. a little bit. Let's hear um, your so, your team's version of stand up. Yeah, <laughs> you're such a comedian. Um, uh, okay, well, we usually well, I, so so in this context. So yeah, we're working on. Um, why ask the questions? What am I supposed to help me out? I thought you said <laughs> I wanted to know how you do it well, on your team. Talk, well, I don't want to talk about anything. I'm working on the team because that might be. You know, no, 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 uh, not but, what you're working on on the team, the, right. the format that your team uses when you guys do stand up. That's all I care about. We were talking they, about they, they, um, they filter... AI and Microsoft build and how the future of AI platform transformation is going to affect you. They are, uh, they usually go through like a screen and then they select like your, your name and it like shows you all the tasks that you've been working on and oh, you wow. give an update for each of those. Oh, wow. <laughs> is that, is that... <laughs> okay. I've never seen. Well, I've only been a part of one team, so just never. Yeah, we, that. 
yeah, yeah. We have like the tickets or whatever that we're like working on. We we, we built we write them ourselves, right? And then they go through and we just summarize each one where we're at and if we're stuck. Yeah, this anything. sounds like a project management meeting, not a stand up. You know, <laughs> you might be onto something. So, uh, we, we, um, we, what we, that you can talk about? Have you been working on? What are you going to work on today? And do you have any blockers or do you need to get with anyone after after stand up? So I, I, I've been working away. Uh, uh, we've got a bunch of, uh, uh, we got a couple of team members that left over the past couple, last month. And so we're sort of picking up their code, working out what the hell it does and trying to figure it out. And we were refactoring all of that. And then we're having a lot of conversations uh, about uh, architecture and this sort of thing. So it's been pretty, pretty interesting. We could be able to get some little smaller products. So I've been, I've been working quite hard. I, I feel like I've got a, quite a lot of stuff done. Uh, um, and uh, I'm very, very happy with it. Um, uh, but uh, still struggling. I'm, I'm currently digging, digging, and trying to get myself a nice little raise. But we'll see how that goes. Mm. Um, well, I hope you get no, it. no, 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 no blockers uh, other than uh, uh, other than colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to talk to anyone after stand up, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. I would prefer it if none of you contacted me after stand up. <laughs> <laughs> something like that something like that i shouldn't be too hard too critical i work with an amazing team but uh mm -hmm. certainly something a lot of challenges and with a lot of shuffling yeah well cool well thank you so very much for hanging out with us for as long as you did great conversation thank you, thank you. great contributions to it yep i appreciate you i'll see you all. i'll see you all on my stream which will happen sometime this year i've still got over half oh really left so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i go. would have right. just you know settled for some time in this decade but sure yeah there you go well <laughs> both could be true all right cool. <laughs> we're off for now oh, these are being so many <laughs> so um some comments about what uh deflux was saying about how his team does stand up uh tvd was like uh deflux not a developer confirmed he's really a pm <laughs> and then that kept going on. Hence <laughs> why he uses AI to code. Um, Peter said, calling someone a PM is the worst insult. Uh, I, I did love how my PM was trying to give me his job before I left. That was one of the selling points. It was, um, what can we do to, to get you to stay? Uh, we did, are, are you, um, wanting to, you know, like do PM type work, uh, with that? interesting I'm like I, i'm a developer i want to write code well what about anything that we've talked about in the past two years have has given you the impression that i want to manage people and and the project itself this much um, anyway um and then solo said uh maybe even worse is development manager anyway where's he going he said he's gonna go off and help his his wife which I'm, I definitely don't want to hold people back from being with the, the person they chose. So I wasn't going to stop them. I mean, Napalm says PM GPT is coming folks. It will get worse. So <laughs> that was the other topic that I guess we didn't really get to. So if you guys want to talk about it in chat, um, I hallucinated requirements. Okay. So maybe it's the same. That is mean, but true. Um, is what do you think about um with agents so if you all know what agents are with ai they are just individual specialized um well they're not really specialized like most of the time you still use agpt you still use a generalized ai not agi but a generalized model that has a whole bunch of information and generalized knowledge but you give it instructions so that it behaves a certain way so agents are you giving this thing an instruction on how you want it to behave and it will act like that so um something that already exists now and i've seen people use it are these um setups where they have multiple gpt agents multiple ai agents that are pretty much the entire development team and they give them all roles and they communicate with each other. So the project manager is in constant communication with the developer and developers are communicating with each other to critique each other's code, make it better. And then, yeah, it just goes on and on. So 
the question is, what do you think about teams getting replaced by that? And the person that is getting paid to do a job is the one that is monitoring this set of AI agents that is performing these tasks pretty much autonomously. <laughs> that is a good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Tikasoft. So on the Agile platform dev, I am going to try introducing AI for planning. We're going to experiment with that. Oh man, it's so much harder when I don't get like verbal feedback because for anyone that does want to respond, you're probably typing and then I don't want to talk too much to get too far ahead of the topic in case you're in the middle of typing. I think this world of yours sounds like a horrible place to be. <laughs> Honestly, I, I am not um super concerned about it because my like just from my perspective i know that there are a lot of people out there like um laborers people that love to do manual labor and having their job taken away by machines that affected them harshly because the sense of self-worth is in the job that they did so i can see that happening to developers who want to write code in this imagined um probably not going to happen but it's still possible world where we don't write a single line of code as developers. Manual labor is the most secure right now. Interesting, I didn't know that. I wouldn't have guessed that actually. I would still think that um, AI being the foreman of these machines was the next step in, in that evolutionary chain. Um, but yeah, so point is that there are people that are like their competency comes, their their self-worth comes from being able to write elegant code or doesn't even have to be elegant, but it's just they can sit down at a computer, throw their hand at a keyboard, output all of this syntax, and they get something on screen that is usable or looks good or whatever. And that is just like really, really valuable to them. So if AI were to take over that, then their their sense of self-worth would be diminished they might feel lost there might be a whole bunch of other factors that come into play if it's done over time where the new breed <laughs> of developers is already learning on ai and already transitioning to just knowing how to use ai to develop an app without needing to write code at all i think they're going to be okay with it just like um the analogy I tried to use earlier, which is I grew up with a keyboard and putting text on a screen in order to write code, whereas my dad, for example, used to have punch cards that he would feed through a machine that would make that machine do certain tasks or compute certain things. And I don't feel any loss at not needing to do that um yeah <laughs> i didn't even get into so just the start of tbd's comment which i will read fully um i didn't i didn't even get into the part where we talk about the ethics and the um skipped steps is what i'm going to call it for the explosion of ai in modern computing in in the world currently um that's not something i think i'm ready to tackle yet but that is definitely a topic we could go through but before i get to tbd's comment yeah before i get to tbd's comment um solo said it's way harder to automate stuff like being an electrician true or a surgeon um i don't know about or a surgeon i don't know if you've seen Neuralink. <laughs> I mean, yes, you still need highly specialized people to monitor it, but I'm pretty sure that thing was, for the most part, autonomous. Um, Napalm said, time to look into learning plumbing, I guess. <laughs> Dukasov said, pipelines? Question, man. All right, so TBD's comment is, I wish we could ask questions of the people developing this stuff what they think the future looks like and what problems they are really solving unfortunately they're all behind corporate curtains and being negative in any way wouldn't really be a good marketing strategy true 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's already a whole bunch of stuff going on in the news. I don't follow it. I just see some, some sometimes things show up on my feed that I don't pay attention to, but you still get exposed to it. Um, but I'm pretty sure that there was something pretty big involving Ilya. <laughs> you did it! First shot, too. Um, but, yeah, so... What is what is the point of changing out or if if we were to imagine what some of the reasons could be not saying these are the reasons these could be completely contrived but if we could imagine what the goal of creating all of these AI uh, technologies would be it could be also AI 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 but what do you think about extension time? Oh, oh yes, yes. That is definitely a topic I want to discuss with you. Let's let's talk about that in a second. Um, <laughs> after this thought. Um, the goal of potentially one of the goals of of continuing growth in AI and having it be able to do all of this heavy lifting, heavy brain work is to remove that cognitive load from people so they have more that they can expand to potentially it could also do the opposite which is make us less expansive and just constrain us to whatever gets fed back into the ai machine over and over and just yeah fall into that trap but we're already doing that with media other topic um but you can imagine being able to accomplish more um, using assistive technology, pretty much augmenting the human condition in a way where we can go beyond our natural mental abilities. So same reason why I have a, a prosthetic. It's just that most humans are um, constrained by the same limited mental capacities. There, there's a limit to how much the human brain can currently do. So AI could be a way to augment that and fill in areas that we didn't even know were areas that we weren't considering. So I have one further point on AI. We're thinking of it from an application development side, true, <laughs> where we're solving problems. Exactly. So I will wait for you to type more. D don't feel rushed if there is more you can type. Okay, but what does AI do for game development? It's creative. Do games all look the same um, when I, AI takes over? Uh, so, <laughs> nice shot. If it, if it actually does come down. <laughs> Dag. <laughs> one day, one day I will add um, the bonus points for air time. Seventy-three only. That looked a lot closer to the middle. Okay, but that is definitely a consideration, though. Um, AI takeover, where. It's not necessarily to the degree of all humanity is is subject to AI, we're enslaved or something, but our opinions and, and the things that we like are governed by what AI produces, which can turn into, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Entropy, where everything looks the same, but we don't know any different by that point in time because we're not the ones being creative. And even when we do try being creative, we are already exposed to all of these other things that we just follow that trend too. We can't think of anything outside of that. So that is a consideration, a very big consideration. But, oh man, I don't know if I can fully talk about it because of course, <laughs> during the day, I really do work quite a bit on on client projects and stuff but i tried to tune in as much as i could to the um 
um, Dustin and Mads talk about C Sharp 13 features. And one of the biggest things that they were talking about were extension types. And extension types looks amazing, in my opinion. <laughs> I could see a whole bunch of applications for them. However, at the same time, I'm like, would I really use them? Would I really use them? Hey, AI assistant, change the archery bot so it uses proper capitalization throughout the app. Somehow my name is capitalized three ways. Oh, wow. Yeah, how did it? <laughs> okay, I'm getting a crossbow. Why did it change your name from all caps? That's weird. I will run resharper tells me to use them. <laughs> So for those, I don't know if I'm going to even be able to explain this correctly, but for those of you that may have missed it, I definitely recommend going out and looking at it. Let me see if I still have the uh, page for it that TBD linked us on Wednesday. I don't. I don't. I have a lot of stuff that I opened in tabs during Wednesday's stream but I don't have the one that you gave us at the end of, here it is. Okay, so these are, oh no. <laughs> I'm gonna crash myself. Okay, here's the link for all of the changes in C Sharp, but specifically um, extension types, is that where we got Dropped extension types. Okay. Um, this is pretty much a way, and I think the simplest way that made sense to me that they described it is like, imagine having a partial class that you get to write, but doesn't have um, access to the private uh, members. So it doesn't really have con context for the underlying class. It just adds things to it. So that is ex uh, implicit extension types. And so that means that you can have instance methods that run on an instance of a class based on that. Yeah, no, <laughs> I don't know where to go with that. That's a really hard one. <laughs> um, gosh. <laughs> Do we call live coding live coding? Live coding or live coding? <laughs> we call them live coding. Ah, <laughs> uh, nope. I keep I keep trying to go through the um the session. And the only thing that I'm seeing is water management and the issue that was going on there for calculating stuff. But I remember them using the implicit extension on string so that they could get back a JSON, uh, pretty much a serialized object from the JSON inside of that string so that they can dot off of it. So they added members to it. They added um, methods, instance methods to it. Okay, Napalm. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you have a fantastic weekend as well. Um, anonymous collection initializers are maze balls. So using just the square brackets and it'll choose the best implementation for you kind of thing <laughs> ring of grievances i'm sorry what one-on-one -on -one is not an airing of grievances it's when you do work oh my gosh <laughs> i mean just check out our our, our podcast i mean our <laughs> Por qué no los dos? oh i guess you can have both I guess. <laughs> I 
That's what driving is. Do you like being the driver? I like being the driver. <laughs> I am the driver. <laughs> it's not even a, I like being the driver. It is I am the driver only ever. <laughs> All right. So implicit extensions are ways for you to extend a an instance of a certain type and they use this for because they plan on um increasing the amount of things that you can create implicit extensions on and what you can do with them so like you can do operators for example um whereas explicit extensions are uh extensions that are <sighs> nope. I don't know enough about it to teach you guys about it. But it it was really cool to watch. I'm going to watch that video about three more times until I actually get it. Thank you. <laughs> that is so true. It was very fail. All right. Thank you, Solo. Uh, are you starting your stream now? Is that why you're dropping? We'll see you soon then if you are. <laughs> awesome. Looking forward to it. I need to start lurking now. Everyone, everyone that I was lurking on rated here, except for Big Gamey. Um, <laughs> so I am no longer lurking on anyone's channel because I never re rejoined. Nanodev is streaming. And who's my number four? We'll do you. Okay. Um, so if you do lead lead equals person, you'll get the be did I miss a comment before this? No. You'll get the behavior of lead of a lead that's explicit. <laughs> it's like it creates an inherited type. Yes. Okay. So was the explicit extension the one that was like the partial class, except without access to instance members? And the, the one that I actually am most excited about were the changes they're making to auto properties. That's the one I think I'll use the most. But I do want to talk about um, extension types because it looks cool. The The thing that I do often is I write extensions on enums. And I think I might have some in here to show as an example. Shared models. Yeah, 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 okay. So imagine this. <laughs> hello, hello, good VJ. Imagine this. You have, and Scott, hello, Scott. I saw you earlier hanging out with Andreas. <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't say something much earlier when he raided in. Um, <laughs> and I just missed it because I would feel bad about missing that. But you've probably been here the whole time, too. <laughs> I I don't I don't really get it. I would I would laugh harder, but I don't know. What <laughs> I'm gonna guess. Oh, wait, that says anonymous. Anonymous played yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say it was apocalypse, but whatever. It was anon. Thank you, anon, for the bits as well. Um, what I was trying to get to is in enums. Okay, it was me, says Bikini. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs> no, it was me. Oh my goodness, you guys are too much. Here's where I think I would use extension types. I typically want to add extra information to my enums. So I pretty much want to create a class out of all of my enum members. 
And so I do that by creating a new attribute and giving it properties that I want for that specific enum so that I could do something like um, uh, whatever my scope is dot get scope type, for example, or give me back all enums that have all scope enums that have a scope type of whatever it is. So to accomplish that, not only do I add the custom attribute with those properties, but I also put extension methods on top of that. What if, what if, and this is a big what if, what if instead of having an attribute, I had an extension type on this and a method that says for this instanced scope, which they're probably, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Um, for this instance scope, give me back the scope name for that scope and then have my logic in there. I still can't really picture how I would do it in an efficient way where I'm not just moving all of these into this method and just doing a switch expression on it. Um, because then I would just have one for each of these properties. And I don't know if it's maybe faster to do it that way or if the attribute is still a good approach at that point in time. So pretty much instead of making a static extension method on every every well, for example, enum. So let's say that this was just enum, then that would apply to every single enum. But I do put it on the scope type. So I don't know. I don't know how it would be different for me. And that's why I keep going back and forth on whether it's going to be beneficial for me to use an extension type. Wouldn't be able to twitch without turbo. Oh. <laughs> Big Amy said to... No, first. Let's go all the way up. Peter said... No worries, I will never spend money on Twitch. And even before that, oh, <laughs> as in we know it wasn't Peter because he wouldn't spend money on Twitch. Got it. <laughs> and then, and then Bikini said, no worries, I will never spend money on Twitch. Not me. Also, live coding has turbo badge. Terrible. <laughs> and then that's when Dukasoff said, wouldn't be, be able to Twitch without turbo. I do it without turbo. I just subscribe to the people that I subscribe to and then I get commercials on everyone else. But yes, nice shooting, good DJ. Ah, got, got him. You did. <laughs> Thank you so much for the bits. You're so kind. Really appreciate it. Um, so yes, tell me more about, about extension types and assuage my I don't know if it's even assuaging um tell me what what I would possibly use them for because I saw what they used them for and those were good examples but I could also see other ways to do them without expression types that are probably just not as efficient maybe that's what the goal is but I can't I haven't been able to figure out for myself um, where in my code am I using just regular extensions or some workaround that I would prefer. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> There's a reason this one costs a hundred bits. It's so terrible. Um, <laughs> what? <up? laughs> anyway, thank you so much for the bits. So short, short statement is I, I don't know where I would use them, but I'm sure if I learned more about them, I'd be using them everywhere. Just like switch expressions, just like um, everything else that I have adopted because I heard about it on a build or a .NET conf or through one of you 
And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Wherever you init something, use a shorter statement. Can you elaborate on that? I mean, I, it's probably hard to type it all out, but if you feel like it, please do, because I'm interested. Um, while he, if Juan Bon wants to do that, <laughs> I will talk about though what they are doing to properties. So auto properties, you just in Visual Studio at least, you just type prop and then you get an int auto property right off the bat. Um, which I can't do inside of a, let's just make it static. Okay. So an auto property is a, um, public field with a getter and setter method. So it used to be that you would type something like public static int. Or it wouldn't even be public, it'd be private. Private static int my property. And then Duke is off with the 500 bits for his theme song. And it's so much shorter than the other one. But I bet you can guess why it costs 500. <laughs> There's no way I'm letting that run for like the entire song. Oh man. <laughs> you guys are being too kind. I'm trying to talk about a really cool C Sharp 13 feature. Are you not entertained? I mean, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate you. You really don't have to do any of this, but you are. And so thank you. Um, A few moments later. <laughs> yes, a few moments later. <laughs> yes, okay, so this thing knows where I'm going with this. Um, this is how you used to write properties back in the day. And then you get um, the concept of a public read-only. Or um, not read-only. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that without using regular property syntax. So um, the, the next thing that happened was instead of having a get and set method like this, you could do public static. Oh, we'll do it using this one since it's already here. <laughs> oh my goodness. All of these that I never hear. Oh my gosh. And that's a, a thousand bits. Duke is off. Thank you. I don't know if I can say anything else. Just thank you. <laughs> You're allowed to do whatever you want. And apparently you want to play as some trance, or that's not even trance. Play as some music in general. Thank you so very, very much. I don't know why, but the uh but doing that caused my notification area in chat to just get covered up. It's very, very odd. So I don't really know what's going on anymore. I broke it for me too. Yay, switch tabs. <laughs> Well, that's fun. <laughs> Except Twitch devs didn't expect Dukasoft. True, true. <laughs> Good break. Oh, okay. Properties, properties, properties. Properties used to be done like this back in 1812 when we first started coding. And, and then and then the .NET team was like, you know, it doesn't really make sense when the only thing you're doing is setting a backing field and uh, TVD Gamer, <laughs> quick, concentrate. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, you're being too kind. So very kind. We have gift subs going out to Onyx Tacular, to Rollers, to Juan Von. Awesome. Juan Von is almost always, well, I guess not always, but Juan Von is here a lot, to Fairy Ring and to Bardaki. Aw, uh, Bardaki got one too. That was really, really kind of you. Thank you so much. Properties, let's go. <laughs> so this was the next iteration of making a property. And then the .NET team was like, what, why, if this is like the common case, why can't we just make a shorthand for this? And so we got this thing called auto properties. And that, that looks like, I can't even convert this to an auto property. That looks like this. And so what this does is it creates a backing field for you behind the scenes and then sets up the getter to return that the value in that field and to re, um, set the value of that field. Um, then they added keywords like init, where, oops, init, which isn't going to work in a static context, but init where um, it's pretty much you set it once and then it stays that value and it must be set when you create your um, instance of that object. And then you have private, so you can put um, accessor modifiers on it. So you can have private set, you can have protected set. Everyone practice protected set. Um, you could use protected set here. You could do whatever, you know, whatever accessibility modifiers uh, internal. Miss the train. I did not. <laughs> I think snippets came out uh, with them for 4.0. I have no idea when snippets came out, but I'm grateful for them. I like them. I only use a handful of them, but they are they are pretty helpful. Oops, as I'm pushing the wrong buttons. Prop full. Oh yeah, right. I could have just used prop full that first time. Thank you. Five is about right. But yeah, thank you all so very much for that hype train. Never ever needed, but always appreciated. Thank you a billion millions for participating in that and just being amazing people in general. You have a hotkey for that one. Awesome. Um, I think I think really <laughs> prop hungry. I think really the only ones that I use are C Tor, Try, and um prop maybe for each i don't think so it's like feech it's one of them anyway yeah sometimes i do four sometimes i do four each if ify um i did write my own um snippets for something that i had to do very often so i made a snippet for it and i can't remember what it was though but i did <laughs> yes for coffee <laughs> absolutely but we're getting to the c sharp 13 feature so one thing that kept happening is let's say that you just had some really minor logic that you wanted to happen every time you were setting Oops. Every time you were setting your property at that point in time, you have to change it to a full prop. Do the thing you wanted to do with all of these changes to just your regular prop. Like one of the things that I do is um, observable properties, essentially. So when I do a set on a property, then I want it to check if the property is already equal to um, if the, if the under, you know, the backing field, so now I need a backing field on top of that, but if my property is already equal to the value that we're trying to set it to, don't do anything. Otherwise set the value and then, um, raise the property changed event for that property. And I would have to create a full prop with a backing field in order to do just that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 
Aw, <laughs> level two hype train emote. Yep. Ah, Aw, it's kawaii. Kawaii this. <laughs> Um, with C-Sharp 13, they are just saying if you already have an auto property and the only thing you want to do is something in the body of the set method or something in the body of the get method, so one or the other, as long as one of them is left untouched, then you could do that directly and you'll now have this keyword field, just like you have the keyword value in here that will represent the backing field so here the syntax would now be if instead of my property it would be if field is equal to the value that it's trying to get set to do nothing otherwise set the backing field to that value and then do whatever other logic you want I thought that was really cool. So it's still an auto property. You don't need to create these read-only backing, or not read-only, I keep saying read-only, these private um, backing fields. You just put a body in set, in your set. So I thought that, that would be one of the most useful ones for me. Because if you look at any of my observable state classes, such as in UI state. Oh, you won't see it in this project. Can we get Finan Man open? Oh, look. <laughs> Sorry. It said, oh, it looks like Big Gamey Zero didn't hit the target. It was way over, missing by 0 0.819 meters. That's a shame, as they scored no points this time. Keep practicing, and remember, it takes time and patience to improve your skills. Did that just hit Big Gamey? <laughs> oh, I do have it. Didn't say notify though. Weird. Most likely. <laughs> I I wouldn't be surprised that it didn't. I mean that it that it actually hit the target but acted like it missed. It's a redeem. So you have to click on the little paw points thingy. Although, I could make it a redeem for... Yeah, I could do the Big Gamey thing. So Big Gamey has a whole bunch of really cool stuff in his stream to begin with. Um, he does use StreamerBot, which helps him do a lot of it. Um, switching out text-to-speech stuff and shoutouts and all of the fun things he has going on in his stream. But one thing that he does do that is split between... Um, subscribers and non-subscribers oh i guess i do need to sign into this um between subscribers and non-subscribers is um he lets people subscribers do a command to do a song request and then non-subscribers have to use a redeem to do a song request and so maybe i could do archery that way But I just like everyone to be able to do everything on the stream, regardless of whether you subscribe or not. Okay, let's look at a, a state class. Excuse me. Where are you implemented? Okay, so you'll see this thing here called base notify property changes. This thingy, if you can actually see, has two events. Well, it implements um, I notify property changing and I notify property changed. So that means that it has two um, public fields. Well, they're they're events, but they're declared like fields, uh, property changed and property changing. And then I've declared two methods essentially for raising the property changed or changing uh, event. And then one helper method for 
setting the field and then raising those events as needed. So whenever I make a, a state class, such as in UI state, which looks like it closed, then I have to create all of these backing fields because in my properties, when I'm setting that property, I use the set field method so that it can raise the property changing and property changed events as that value is changing. So this is going to be a lot easier where I would get rid of all of my backing fields and then have this just be ref field. And so I wouldn't have to keep track of, you know, where is my backing field for this thing? Is this even a good place to put them? in this region up here. And then I need to remember to do that for every single property that I want to be observable. Even though it's not really the observer pattern or anything, it's just, this is how I am um, doing registration for mutable or changing properties in state. Another shout out for Big Gamey. Awesome. Again, if you have not checked him out, definitely do he's a great person i love hanging out on his stream love just being around him he's got a great personality and great content on his stream he streams two games uh development game development the first one is his primary game called life of dog called homeward hound um and it is a really kawaii little game where you play as a dog who gets separated from his people through various events and you need to make your way back to them and the second game is one where you get eaten by zombies and you don't want to do that but it is fun to watch him do it uh watch him work on it <laughs> is that a chicken with its head cut off or is that a head with its chicken cut off or is that neither i cannot tell is it a llama I think it's a llama. Probably a llama. <laughs> Neither, but I like where you're coming from. <laughs> Looks like a llama nodding. So yes, it's too tiny. And then if I get too close, then I'm too close to the microphone and just super duper loud. You hush, fun. Nobody asked you. Okay, well, we did talk about the C-sharp uh, 13 things. I wanted to, I, I didn't leave very much time to talk about them because I am not fully comfortable with um, extension types, but I wanted to have something to say about it because TBD did bring it up on Wednesday. And it is a fantastic feature. I just need to figure out where I would use it and what exactly what benefits I can get from it. I just know that I want to use it. And it's an alpaca. Aha. Cool. I'm not sure they are certain that everything is in 13 yet. Their notes so far aren't clear. Yeah, and it sounds like they have a lot more stuff that they want to put into 13. But it also sounded like they're going to be releasing 13 with uh, .NET 9 in November. And with the state of where things currently are it doesn't really seem like it um as far as the page because um mad said or they both pointed out something about the page that has all of the features and stuff that are currently being developed um and it's very minuscule but that the other page that shows everything that they want to work on has a lot of stuff on it but anyway, we are nearing the end of the stream and I am going to get back to my regular day job that I'm really excited to be back at. So um, look forward to in the future at some point in time, I will be getting back to streaming my day job. Um, <laughs> daytime, I get to do this fantastic work as my job now. Um, I'm glad I had the experience with the people that I used to work with. But I'm also glad that I'm no longer doing that. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, back to it. I, like I promised earlier, I'm going to have hiccups. 
and I'm going to talk like I'm saying something that is actually important, even though I am not saying anything that's important right now. I'm just filling in a time gap while I remember how to type his name. But we will be reading over to the one, the only, Solo Solipsist, as long as I can type his name correctly. Yes. Wait, did you actually type it for me? No. <laughs> that would have been cool. Um, we'll head over there. He's currently got the Aliens vs. Predator on his head and doing some more Apple Vision type stuff. Um, we saw him make his his avatar of himself dance uh, not too long ago. But if you want to see that again, then yeah, it's it's wild. Okay, but I will be back again on Monday um, at some point in time. Can you ask Elvis a question on his, or you can ask Elvis a question on his stream. And I think you said, was that Evil Knievel? <laughs> because he, he kind of has the Evil Knievel white gem studded thing that Elvis is known for wearing as well. But anyway, uh, posting the VOD for this to YouTube some point between now and Monday, maybe on Monday. And other than that, I'll be back on Monday at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time, UTC minus 6. Feel free to hop into our Discord if you feel like it. And that's it. Time is running out. Just going to do the waving thing. I need to do more waves faster. Catch up. Okay, that should be enough. Bye.